Can you please give us your views in terms of what a South Africa we need to be thinking about around the hydrogen infrastructure, specifically around mobility? Well, I have disrupted this perspective, and <coughs> South Africa tried to uh, seek to uh, suggest seeking to leverage I mean, much, much of the inherent domestic capabilities and resources. Yes, I would also like to define, I'm going to say, when one says hydrogen infrastructure for mobility, I would also say that for hydrogen, you could also think of methanol, particularly for mobility, because increasingly you are seeing ultimately green methanol as a carrier, a storage medium for hydrogen in different mobility use cases, particularly in heavy duty, medium to heavy duty, off-roads, and also uh, maritime. Okay, so what you have as a power train, the power converter, is actually a fuel cell itself. It's a reformed methanol fuel cell. And which can be scaled up to whatever the power requirements. But as I also stress that most, the majority, I think almost all of the mobility use cases are hybrid power trains. So if it's a, a hydrogen fuel cell there, it's the power train itself is typically hybridized with the battery. <coughs> and so I think you know the uh, battery itself acts as the backup or the charger because of the load. So going back to the original, you know, the, the, the whole question, I mean, I think there's a chance, obviously, the, the work has got, got to be done, where you have the expression that has been used um, extensively in this conference, no silver bullet. It's, a, it's, it's a, a mix of solutions. Some solutions lend themselves very well, you've seen, seen them, hydrogen to hydrogen fuel cell. Others, I think lend themselves better for cost, performance, all the fun functionality, all of those. I think, for instance, a liquid fuel, such as methanol, and you get hydrogen out of that. So you see what is more cost effective from what makes sense. Uh, thank you, John. Um, uh, Tim and Charles, um, just on the green hydrogen production side of, um, of this, that's absolutely uh, necessary. Um, do, do you see, um, I'd like for both of you to talk to, uh, given the global experience both your firms have, in the South African context, as John has just mentioned, that, uh, and Paul has also mentioned about the complexity of the infrastructure. Obviously, the, 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 the cost of hydrogen is a, is a key component, and as we set up this infrastructure, uh, what are your thoughts around that? Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, John, you, you've alluded to a few critically important aspects. Um, there's maybe a first of those is that you need to pick the right technology for the right application. Um, and, you know, there's, let's say, for, for vehicles that need uh, high, high, high power, long distance transport, um, short refueling times, and aspects where there's pay payload restrictions on the vehicles or let's say a negative penalty for a high, high weight content. Those sorts of things you know, are not necessarily well suited to power by battery, as an example. Um, you know, and then there can be evaluations and questions whether it's a gaseous hydrogen that needs to be there, whether it's liquid hydrogen that makes more sense, um, and also whether there's centralized production facilities or distributed production facilities. You know, on one hand, you get an efficiency and cost of, of scale, um, and on the other hand, you get a good distribution and and um, you know a thorough market presence into that environment, and so that infrastructure requirements is quite a challenge, and, and how to mix and to evaluate that is is, is quite a challenge. And companies like Linda and Air Products and others are able to evaluate those kind of uh, you know in, uh, opportunities and, and demand in order to to scale up and meet those requirements in the most cost-effective manner. And um, so, so on one hand, there's, there's that. On the other hand, there's the, the, the risking on the, on the technology side. I mean, you know, the technology of, of whether it's fuel cells or whether it's, um, you know, I heard Paul mentioning other direct injection or uh, combustion of, of hydrogen as well in vehicles. You know, there's, there's all this kind of technology that's still at a new, uh, a new point here. 
And with all of these different models, there's many different um, technologies that are more suitable to those applications. And so as, as, as we're all walking down this path, I think there'll definitely be winners that emerge. And um, those will accelerate, those will be accelerated, and others that may not be as, as efficient and, and will be then uh, fall out the race. Uh, maybe to just broaden the, the whole supply chain in a way, open yes. up that discussion. And, and one or two uh, elements that touch this on what Tim has already alluded to. But if you, if you look at what the bottlenecks in the supply chain are, mm -hmm. I mean, you and I have had discussions in the past. A hydrogen molecule is a fraction of what it costs from, to get it to the end user. If you have to take it from where it's produced to another location, that the cost is restrictive because it actually doesn't matter what your hydrogen costs, whether it's green or not, because the, the cost of the distribution is going to become the bigger component. But the other component that hits it quite hard is that how are you getting that hydrogen to the end user? If you're still using a diesel truck, it's a, it's a problem. Um, you, you no longer have the low carbon footprint that you're hoping for to get to the end user. So that, that is another complexity. So to touch what Tim said, the distributed model actually works better in many respects. But the distributed model will need you to get power to all the locations so that you can put electrolyzers on those locations and generate the hydrogen where you actually need it. But let's take a step back. Um, around the world, most of the projects that have come about have been focused on what I think somebody referred to yesterday as a back-to-base type scenario. So if we can start with the scenarios where <coughs> truck fleets, bus fleets are coming back to the same base every day so that they can be refueled, you don't have to necessarily roll out that infrastructure throughout the whole country. Because going back to my first point, it's, it's going to be quite a significant exercise to roll out electrolyzers throughout the country to make it a viable economy. So you've got to really start with the, those mean nodes, those niches, where you can work the, with the back-to-base scenario, but avoid the, the transport component because that is going to hit you from both the environmental angle and from the, the um, costs at the side. Okay. Thank you, Charles. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, um, it's, it's, it's a very complex, uh, difficult undertaking. Uh, but I think that should not deter us, right? Because the truth of the matter is that you do have fuel cell trucks and buses running on roads in different parts of the world as we speak today. Um, and, Alan, I'd like for you to please um, share with us um, some of the experience that Cumming has in terms of rolling out those fleets. Um, uh, uh, that have uh, that you you have had uh, exposure to. Yeah, because that's, yeah, thanks. Really. Actually, you know, to to your, your point, right? I think we we comes are really picking a very practical way of looking at how we have to deal with the present, how we have to deal with the transition, how we have to deal with the future. So just be really clear about the case, because we are not going to be able to turn the work of our team like this, right? So you have to look at this. From that perspective, let's give some examples, right? For example, the, the um, Austin train, you know, probably most of us have heard you know, recently about their train running 100% um, factory in Germany. That is powered by a few cell. Now, that didn't come yesterday. It was three years in the making. The whole project, you know, to get to here. So why did we choose that, right? To use that point, if you have a fixed rock, you don't have to deal with the massive infrastructure to deploy. Then you have a base case to go forward. So that's one example. The second example I, I would provide is so like school bus. In North America, or a lot of places have school buses, but we deploy fuel cell into the school buses, right? And we had to deploy them quite successfully. So the, the thing is, and then we we'll also look at the 
buses, you know, like transit buses, similar thing. We do have, we, we had to find a way not to try to resolve those like simple check and get, you know, even fashion issues. But in my view, those can be resolved when there is not a chicken egg, let's first resolve there is a definite chicken and egg. <laughs> and then we can have to walk. So then we can walk from there. So taking those successful applications and developing the economy around it. They, you know, earlier Paul talked about the cost of manufacturing being higher than all those. Then it's going to be very high if we have low value. By aggregating all of those applications, that today we, we see a lot of those. By really working that, you start to you know build the scale economy and improve the technology. And any technology, regardless, we are going through its development stage. Today it will not be you know as good as we want to be in 20 years. Well, if we're all just waiting for that perfect thing in 20 years. Guess what? Now, 20 years later, we'll be still the same day. So we have to be able to deploy things where it makes sense. So not only build the economy of scale recovery, but also provide opportunity to learn, to improve, so we we'll all get out of the world. And think about the cars. You know, at the beginning you know, of many hundreds. Were they as good as we are today? Were they really expensed back then? Of course. But this will take time to work the same thing. So I really think, you know, so in those kind of cases, we do need to look at that. So come to take those, those approaches. That's why you see us, we have our traditional, you know, uh, technology. Even on that, we prove like, you know, my friend here says, you know, the order zero six, which is, significantly lower in emission, right? But at the same time, we're also deploying fuel cells for trains, deploy fuel cells for school buses, and we deploy fuel cells for stationary power for uh, gas applications. We're doing it. We don't, we're not really waiting. So the other thing is, let's not debate whether this is a perfect solution or not. For example, if we keep talking about, okay, so if, if my car is transported by diesel, okay, great, I understand, that's an imperfect situation. But guess what? It's actually, if you have using one diesel to transport 10 cars, you already reduce by 80%. It's not perfect, and it's better. I, I think we really need to maybe think in those more practical. So now as we are better, we should be celebrating. Don't be say, okay, we're better, so it's 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 an goal. So I would like to use a phrase that you know I learned from some of my uh, my friends uh, you know says in this kind of case I always say innovation, you know, take this this uh, be happily um, be happy to Be happy in, uh, um, sorry, I lost it. But, anyways, I'll come back. Basically, continue to think about improvement over time, but not to be satisfied to the point that you're not making progress. Always challenge yourself, challenge ourselves, but always celebrating what you have done, have improved. Not looking for the 100% perfect thing. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abner. Um, very helpful to hear and it's all about you know what yards can we progress on and what progress can we make and the fact that we're not looking for perfection on day one right and um, and ultimately it's all about how do we actually implement um, so Andy, I want to turn to you around you know you, you initially the first phase of your bus project was the diesel buses which are you know, reduce carbon emissions, but I understand that you have ambitions beyond that. Would you like to share? 100%. So, um, I'd like to pick up on um, what Anne says. So, we had a huge debate with the municipality 
in terms of us saying, look, because we are importing technology from the UK, they are on Euro 6. We would like to actually offer you a Euro 6 product. And then they went back and said, look, how are we going to feel this thing? Because we have 50 ppm in the people, which is what we are talking about around, we have a hub, which is filled with 50 ppm diesel. But with the Euro 6, it requires 10 ppm. Like this, not so actually produces 10 ppm. But the impediment behind that is the PFMA. So if you know how cities procure, they will come and say, can you, can you please supply us with 100 diesel buses? Right? You say, you, you do the tender, you win. Then they come back and say, now we're looking for someone to come and service those buses. Somebody else will win that tender to come and service those buses. Then they'll come back and say, now we're looking for someone to supply the fuel for those buses. Somebody else will win the tender. So what is required actually is, is more of an integrated approach. So our, our evolution in terms of our bus business is we, we, we've convinced them to take the Euro 6. We've also promised them that we will assist in leapfrogging even away from a pure battery to a hydrogen and a fuel cell. The only way though that we think this can be done is by creating a hub a localized modular system to produce hydrogen to feed that feed. But for it to be even more successful long term, we need to partner them, because on my trailer business I have a lot of logistics companies who are interested in converting their trucks to fuel cell. To partner the two to say, when you go there to pick up cars from the you know from the from the harbor, hopefully it's it's BMW, you know, electric cars or Nissan or whatever. You can put them on a fuel cell truck, but you fuel the truck alongside where the municipality fuels its gas basket. So as a result, I actually started a new business to look at how to deliver modularized hydrogen fueling stations that are producing on-site. And I'm hoping you can help me with some of the technology there.